Welcome to Harvest Bible Chapel in Barrie. We're glad to have you join us in our worship and time in the Word today from our facility at 7 George Street. If you're joining us for the first time, please let us know in the chat so we can meet you personally. If you're watching on demand, send us an email. On your smartphone, tablet, or laptop, go to hbc.info to access today's sermon notes, Harvest Kids lesson, the Connect form, and the What's Happening tab. Thanks for tuning in. We're glad you're here. Let's join our Harvest family in the worship center now. Alicia, it is so wonderful to be here with you this morning. For those of you who are here for the very first time, welcome to you. We are so glad that you're here and would love to get a chance to meet you and put a small gift into your hands. So after the service, make sure you head out into the lobby to Guest Central where one of our pastors will be waiting to greet you and put a small gift into your hands. Now, if you're tuning in from the live stream for the first time, please let us know that you're here in the Connect form. The Connect form is something that we ask everyone to do every week, and this is a way that we know that you're here with us, and more importantly, how we can be praying for you. There are a few ways that you can accomplish this task, so make sure you either pull out your camera on your smartphone, point it at the QR code beside me, and it will take you straight there. You can also head to hbc.info, and just underneath you'll find the Connect form tab. Also, if you are here in person on the very far right-hand side of your row, you guys will find a black Connect folder. Please pick that up, fill that out, and pass it along to your neighbor with a smile. It's okay if you've already done it online. Just keep passing it along so that everybody gets a chance to fill out the Connect form in the way that they are most comfortable. Now, there are so many ways that we could be serving the Lord, and you might be wondering, where is best for me to serve, or how can I help? Well, our volunteer coordinator, Catherine Celia, loves to connect you guys to having wonderful volunteer experiences. And she is going to be out in the lobby today after the service and can help connect you with the leaders in the church ministry that you are looking to serve in. So make sure you head out there and check that out. Also, Harvest Young Adults, you guys have a lunch right after this service, so don't forget about that upstairs. Well, guys, if you are able, let's stand and worship our great and amazing God. Good morning, church family. It's good to see you all. Glad you made your way uh, through the snow. Well, not today, but man, it was a lot earlier this week. My back's still hurting from shoveling. I'm excited to be here with you today. Uh, I, I truly believe uh, God wants to meet you in this place. And so um, I want to open up with John 15. Uh, Jesus talks about that he's the true vine. And so he also prunes us to carry good fruit for him, for, for God's glory. So John 15, uh, just after this in verse 8, he, uh, Jesus further says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I love you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. And so, friends, we welcome Lord Jesus, in this place, we welcome the Holy Spirit. We make way for God to take His throne right here. And we're obedient to Him. So in this time of worship, I want to encourage you to open up your heart. 
Uh, this next song says, Nothing here is hidden. Come as you are. Give it all to him. Make way for him. Make way for the King of Kings to come take his place. And let's worship him together.
Cause you alone are holy, only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. Search the world.
same spirit now as we pray. Take whatever posture is going to work for you as we go before the Lord. Let's pray. Worthy is your name, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power forever and ever. We sing these incredible truths about you, our living God, and we declare to the world today with fresh praise that you are alive. You are working in us. You're answering prayers, listening to us as we call your name. You are holding us up as we do your will, never letting us go, and always shaping us to be a people who are worthy of your name. As we come to you in prayer, we say thank you for Jesus Christ, who has overcome sin and obtained the victory over death. Thank you for Jesus' life, for his cross, for his resurrection, and his Holy Spirit. And forgive us, Lord, for taking our salvation for granted because we were purchased by the precious blood of your innocent Son, the Lamb, and the Redeemer. So, Lord, help us to live for you with the same passion that we sing these songs today. 
Father, as we pray, I know that in this room and on the live stream and throughout this week as people hear this message, we will all have burdens in our hearts. We'll be burdened with responsibilities for work and our families, burdened with sorrows and grief and regrets. We have bodies burdened with illness. And Lord, some of us have already been praying for relief for a long time. Help us as we wait on you to see what you will do with our humble lives. God, may we be a people who live to serve you and not simply praying just to escape our pains and burdens. Help us to remember that your grace, your grace, your grace is sufficient for us today. It's enough for us as we wait on you to move in our families. It's enough for us as we seek to serve you, even as, though, even as we look for permanent work. Your grace is enough for us as we wrestle with our addictive patterns and repetitive thoughts. And your grace, O oh Lord, is enough for us when this world seems that it's way too much. As we've been reading, Lord, in the Revelation, it's the people who put their faith in you. These are the ones that will overcome the world and its evils. So today, Lord, we pray as your overcomers. We call out to Jesus and we say, come and win in our lives today. As we prepare now to look into your enduring word, open our minds and give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Work through Todd and the team who will help present this message and give us just what we need for this day. We pray this in the incomparable and the matchless and the most beautiful name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, church. As Todd comes, please open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 19. Thanks, Dwayne. Thanks to uh, the team. A decidedly uh, older worship team this morning, eh? Did you notice that? Well, not, not you, not, not you, Edu. You brought the average age down, you and Mitch. But, uh, but no, honestly, like, it's, it's awesome because in some ways I was looking on this stage and really Don and Woody, Ben, uh, Chad uh, have put in, like, 20 years in this church serving in worship ministry and uh, pretty awesome to have them kind of all together in, in this band. They've played a lot of services together and led a lot of people in worship over those years. So pretty awesome uh, to, have, uh, to have them leading us. Uh, this morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Revelation 19 is where we're going to be if you're not already there in your Bibles. I, um, <clears throat> I liked the way uh, Dwayne kind of finished up his, his prayer there because he talked about, you know, um, Todd's going to come up, uh, pray for him and the team that's going to help deliver the word right now. And there really is a team of people helping to deliver the word right now. It's not just me up here. And there's a team of people involved during the week as well. And I actually thought that I would give you just a little, like the smallest picture of, of what the week looks like here um, for me when I'm, when I'm prepping. Early in the week, I begin just kind of making notes on the basis of the text, usually just me and the text or, or the scripture passage. Um, sometimes I'll read a preliminary commentary in, in the early part of my study. And then along during the week, usually by Wednesday, I'll have an outline, uh, the outline that you see in the notes, I'll have that outline uh, prepared, and then I send it to the pastoral team, and I get their input on that, and they often uh, suggest, oh, maybe this is a better word, or could you explain this a little bit better? And so I'll, I'll edit the uh, outline um, appropriately, and then it's finalized, it gets uploaded to Dropbox, um, at the latest by Thursday, and then um, and then it's, that, it's set. That's the outline, and that's what we're going to go with for the week. Then on Friday, uh, this is my dedicated day to write the message, and, and so I don't take any appointments or do any meetings on Fridays. I, I generally just spend the time in my study, and I produce this printed manuscript. I do a, a markup of it on Sunday mornings before I preach uh, early Sunday mornings. Anyways, that's kind of a, a scope of what the week looks like, and so I went through that again. I did the outline this week. I uh, finalized it. I put it in Dropbox, and then Friday, I went back to it, as I do, because now I'm going to write the manuscript. And on Fridays, I read further commentaries, and then I, I actually just write. And it was at that point in my prep this past week where I kind of looked at my outline again, and I looked at this, this main idea, this, this imperative that's actually based on verse 14 in the passage we're going to read in a moment, which is the armies of heaven were following Jesus, were following Jesus on white horses. That's what I was thinking of when I wrote the imperative in your notes, 
ride with Jesus. That's the main point of this message, to ride with Jesus. But on Friday, when I sat down and I read that again, I went, oh, you know what? For sure some Christian biker group has used that phrase before. For sure. And I hadn't thought about that earlier in the week. So then, you know, you do what you do. Google that. And the internet did not disappoint me because immediately it became very obvious that many different biker groups along the way have used these different expressions, uh, the different variations on the expression, uh, ride with Jesus. There's a few more just going to come up here uh, quickly. And um, this last one, obviously, you know, I... I <laughs> I ride with Jesus, I ride with Jesus, riding with Jesus, ride with Jesus. Now, these are the Calvinists. Jesus rides with me. I don't know, like it's, there's a different theological perspective on that last one. But, um, but listen, with all due respect to our Christian biker friends, and there might be some here, um, it, is not white, it is not Harleys, but white horses that we're going to ride in on in the last day, right? It's, it's white horses that we're riding in on at the second coming of Christ. And that's what we're seeing. That's the latter part of Revelation 19 here today. The rider on the white horse is Jesus. We're gonna see him in a moment. The armies of heaven follow in behind him. And, and then the long predicted defeat and utter destruction of the beast and the false prophet, the kings of the earth, and all those who took the mark of the beast on themselves. And that's what we're gonna see in the passage today. And, and as we do that, here's, here's what's coming at us. Here's, here's what the appeal is. I appeal to you, if you are unsaved, to believe in and join with the rider on the white horse. That's what this message is gonna be about. If you have not yet committed your life to Jesus Christ, you would do that today. And to the already saved, the message comes just like it has been coming throughout the entirety of this series in Revelation. To the already saved, it's hang on, persevere, keep enduring, be encouraged, find your faith strengthened in what you see in Jesus Christ today, what we see in these prophecies and these end time events as they unfold before us. I pray that you'd be strengthened in your faith today through all of that. So let's turn our attention to the scriptures, Revelation 19, 11, verse 11 to the end of the chapter, and then we'll start uh, looking at these verses together. The Apostle John writing uh, these of visions that he sees. He says, then I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice, he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And they saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he had deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh." Well, here's the imperative, ride with Jesus. And as we do that, we'll see the end of all evil. I mean, we've been building throughout the book of Revelation, we've been building, building, building toward this moment. But even then, we are going to see that this passage is not the complete and utter final chapter where Satan will be defeated. That's in our next section in chapter 20, in the first uh, 10 verses. 
But as I said in the introduction, the defeat, this is the defeat of every other character in this alliance, this axis of evil. Now, what we're going to do in this message is, in, in, is we're going to look at the second paragraph. There's two paragraphs I read. We're going to look at the second paragraph first and then come back to the first uh, section of verses. It starts at verse 17. John sees this angel standing in the sun who's calling out with a loud voice, and he's, he's calling out to all of the birds. And what we see next is what one commentator calls a gruesome parody of the messianic banquet that we had seen in the previous verses. That's the marriage supper of the Lamb, to which all the redeemed have been invited to go to this marriage supper. It's a beautiful thing. It's something we want to be a part of. But in contrast to that, we have this other supper, this, this gruesome parody of the messianic banquet, which the commentator calls a grotesque feast representing the crushing defeat of these enemies of God. So this invitation goes out, this invitation to the birds. Come gather for the great supper of God. Verse 18, to eat the flesh of kings, captains, mighty men, horses and their riders, all men, no discrimination here. If they, if they oppose God, no discrimination, free and slave, small and great. And then John pauses to note verse 19, that he saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies. They're gathering to make war against him who is sitting on the horse and against his army. Now, we're going to look at him. We're going to look at Jesus in the second part of this message. But John tells us here, verse 20, that the beast was captured even before the fighting, it seems, before the fighting even started. So was the false prophet who had deceived every person Every person who had taken the mark of the beast on themselves, every person who had worshiped the image of the beast. All of these people throughout all of history who had the scriptures, who had people preaching the gospel to them, who knew the truth, who had every opportunity. We've seen this throughout our study of Revelation so many times, God delaying, God delaying, God delaying, God sending signs, God sending prophets, and they refused to repent and denied the message. And this is their fate. They were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. Now, there's so many allusions here in what we're reading in this vision to Old Testament prophecies in, in Isaiah, in Ezekiel, in, in, in Jeremiah, and in Daniel, especially in Daniel 7.10. In fact, we have this image that there's fire flowing from the throne of God. And it's that fire that is now seen here to be filling the lake of fire that which will, will, will be the place of judgment. This is the very righteousness and holiness of God, the very standard by which judgment will happen. In fact, before Revelation is done, we're going to hear three more references to the lake of fire. So we're going to come back to talk about that in some detail. But as for verse 21 here, the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting, sitting on the horse. That is to say, they were slain by what we'll see in verse 13 is the word of God. They were slain by the word of God. And then this grisly description, John concludes by saying, all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Now, you'll understand, as I do, that it's an indignity to not bury a body. And that's what we're seeing here is, is those who have rejected God being shamed. It's an indignity for these bodies to be left, as the word is, is carry-on for the birds. The word carry-on, Mer Merriam Webster, uh, Webster de defines it as, as dead and putrefying flesh. It's something that, I, look, I don't mean, I'm not, I'm not sensationalizing anything here. This is the image that we're seeing in the scripture. It's necessary for us to talk about this so that we understand the gravity, the intensity of this situation. But it's something that's nauseating. Like if you've ever watched a bird eating flesh, it's nauseating. Birds pecking away at the dead. Our reference point, the only reference point we would have for this, I would suspect, is that when we see some crow on the side of the road eating roadkill. And this is far more intense than that. Well beyond any picture we could ever understand. 
or grasp in our minds. But why? Why is it so critical that we would see this, that we would see this judgment described as it is? And George Eldon Ladd said this. He said, the second coming, this is so important for us to grasp this, it's going to give us our rationale for why this paragraph is here. The second coming of Christ is an absolute essential theme in, the, in New Testament theology. In his cross and resurrection, Christ won a great victory over the powers of evil. By his second coming, which is what is pictured here, he will execute that victory. Apart from his return to purge his creation of evil, here's the key phrase, redemption re remains forever incomplete. And, and listen, you and I know that, coming here to be part of, of, uh, of this gathering today, to hear God's word, to worship the Lord, to be together with other believers, we know how incomplete our redemption remains. Even if we've made our commitment to Christ, if we're believers and had our sins forgiven and we have all these promises and these assurances from God, even with that hope of eternity that we have before us, we're still having to live it out down here with all the temptation and all the trials and all the difficulties we go through in life. And we know just how hard it is to live our lives on planet earth. And that's because our redemption is still incomplete. It's not fulfilled in full. And we're waiting for that. We're waiting for this judgment to happen, for the righteous judgment and justice of God to be enacted. Now listen, before we kind of leave this point, I want to do a little sidebar here because I feel like this is the important moment to do this. So is, with your permission, I'll do a little sidebar. Everybody good? You're good if I do this? I'm going to do it anyway. But I mean, I'm just asking to be, to, just to be polite. <clears throat> I'm going to do a little sidebar here because this is, as Lad says, this is the second coming of Christ. And some of you may have been waiting for the entire series. You may be waiting for me to talk about the rapture. How many people have been waiting for me? When's he going to talk about the rapture? Is he going to talk about it today? Today might be the day. And I am, but only in this sidebar uh, kind of way. Because you're waiting for when this falls into the timeline. But here's the thing. The rapture is never mentioned in the book of Revelation. And that's the book I'm preaching. So then I don't really have to mention it. Um, and some of you, maybe some of you who are super savvy are going to say, wait a minute, I know the Revel that, that Revelation 3.10, all the way back toward the beginning of the series, the rapture was kind of mentioned there and kind of is the operative word. Here's the verse, Revelation 3.10. This is in the letter uh, to the Philadelphians. And so Revelation 3.10 kind of hints at something. People who believe in the rapture, though, want to say this is definitely the rapture. He says this, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. And so if there's going to be this intense time of tribulation, this is interpreted to mean that Jesus is going to take all the believers and pop them out of planet earth for this time of tribulation to actually happen. But the verse doesn't actually say that. And when we were, when we were looking at this in message eight in the series, um, we understood that this is about to be consistent with all of the other themes in Revelation and in all of the apocalyptic literature, in fact, in all of the scriptures, to be consistent with that. We understood that this was about protecting believers through difficulty as opposed to removing them from the difficulties to come. Protecting believers through difficulty as opposed to removing them from the trial that is to come. Because, because again, to say that, you know what, I'm just going to pull you out of it so you don't have to go through it, Christian, it just seems to contradict what we see in all of the other prophecies. That is the message that we are to endure. In fact, that is the primary theme, aside from this just being a beautiful picture of eternity and of Jesus Christ our Lord, the point of the revelation is, is um, a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. We saw that in chapter 13. We saw it in chapter 14. That's like the primary reason the book was written. It is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. God's going to give you what you need to actually get through this. Now, the main, I don't have to do this, but I'm just doing it because I'm, I'm a super nice guy. Just believe that. The one rapture verse, the one rapture verse in the scripture is 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, right? And some of you were thinking that, well, Todd, what about this verse? 
And this is a common funeral verse. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17 says this, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. We've seen all those images in Revelation. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So something cool is going to happen here. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the war, Lord. So listen, the, the word rapture never appears in the Bible. The only place that we get it is we get it in English from a Latin word that was a Latin translation of the Bible. And it was a translation of this little phrase, caught up. So that's what rapture is. It came to us a different way. So it's this whole idea of when this happens. And when we look at the scriptures, we never want to make the scriptures more, say more than what they're saying. And so if we look at the plain meaning of what these verses say, all we can say about this, because we can't precisely land it anywhere on the timeline, all we can say about this with certainty is that at some point, at some point, we will be caught up together with the Lord in the air. That's what we can say with certainty. Now, based on a fuller understanding of the apocalyptic, it would seem that this happens here in Revelation chapter 19. That it's at this moment, at the second coming of Christ, that the dead in Christ and those who are alive in Christ will be caught up with Jesus to join him in this battle and to uh, go uh, to battle to, into, into this warfare, into this battle with the evil elements with Satan and his minions. And so that's all we can say with certainty. And if you want to track this down a little bit more, read a little bit more about this, I've put two links in the sermon notes. One is to an article and one is to a podcast actually with John Piper that's very, very clear on uh, the second coming of Christ. I think those will be beneficial and a blessing to you. Okay, um, and sidebar, back to the sermon. One further note before we move on to the next point, though. We do a disservice to the visions if we see these only as spiritual, spiritualized representation of life as a believer now. And some people approach Revelation that way. They just see it as all, this is all just imagery of what our Christian life is right now, and there's no really uh, future element to all of that. And we've talked about this at different times in this series. But what we are seeing here are images of a real final battle and a decisive victory over sin and evil that is prefigured by the spiritual battle we, we, we uh, face every single day. We never want to take the apocalyptic visions, in other words, we never want to take those and confine those to an either-or interpretation. Like either they have to be future or they have to be fulfilled now in our own time. In fact, we should be embracing a both-and interpretive principle because we embrace this idea of the now but not yet. In other words, many of the things we see in Scripture can have partial fulfillments now. These things can be happening now in anticipation of the future, final, ultimate, culminating fulfillment that will come yet in the future. So what we're seeing in Revelation, specifically here in chapter 19, what we're seeing is a depiction of the spiritual warfare we currently face in the metaphysical realm, so spiritual realm, in advance of a future battle fought and won in the physical realm, a battle that we will actually see. And a future battle where we will all ride with him and where we will see the end of all evil. Amen? Looking forward to that day? There should be a longing in our heart for that. And then we're going to see that all of this, everything we've just been looking at in this second paragraph, all of it is wrought simply at his word, simply at the word of Jesus. So we're going to look back to that first paragraph now. And, and really, <clears throat> here's the thing, because now we're going to see us as part of the, the armies of God riding into battle. And it's so cute. It's so cute when well-meaning but overreaching Christians think that Jesus needs us to fight with him in order to win this battle. Isn't that cute? It's so cute that you think that. Um, it, it's, it's like, you know, it's actually, it's like when you have little kids, like, like three, four-year-olds, and they're starting to do things with you, and so you take them out to the driveway, and you're going to wash your car, and they're going to help you wash the car, and, and especially if you're like, you're like really particular about how you wash your car, they're like dropping the sponge, and now there's dirt and stones in it, and they're rubbing it on the car, and it's driving you crazy. You know very well, they're not helping you wash the car, 
But in their minds, the three-year-old, the four-year-old thinks, I'm really helping wash the car here. And that's what this is like. We think we're helping Jesus because we're riding with him. We're the three-year-olds riding along. But listen, we're not really helping wash the car or win the battle at all. In fact, when you look at Revelation 19, you just go, there isn't really any kind of actual battle that takes place. There's no fight here. There's no need for us really even to be there. We don't fight. It doesn't seem like the angels fight. There are some hints in some other apocalyptic passages that point to some involvement that we might have. But the reality is the word of God itself does all of the fighting. The word does all of the fighting. And even then, not much of a fight. It's he speaks, it's over. It's over with a word. In fact, uh, George Eldon Ladd said this as well. To mo- just to help us understand the Word of God, this phrase, the Word of God, to modern Christians, the Word of God is primarily the Bible. In the New Testament, the Word of God is primarily the good news of the gospel, whether proclaimed by Jesus or by the apostles. Christ, in his own person, is the Word of God par excellence. And this is the key phrase here, the embodiment of God's total redemption. That's what we're waiting for is the total redemption. That's what the other quote from Ladd was pointing us to, this complete redemption that we're longing for. This is Jesus. This is Jesus, the embodiment of God's total redemption. This is the word of God. In fact, John, who's receiving this vision and writing it down for us in the Revelation, also wrote a gospel that bears his name, also wrote three letters that bear his name. And in the gospel and in the first of his letters, we have these ascriptions or these opening, uh, this opening paragraph of each of those documents. And both times he points to Jesus as the word, the living embodiment of the word of God. John 1, 1 to 5, 1 John 1, 1 to 3, both of them speak of Jesus in this way. Jesus as the word. And so let's get to the details of what we see about Jesus here. Because though it's not explicitly stated that John is seeing Jesus, it's pretty obvious that's who this is. And he draws largely from Old Testament visions and imagery. He describes this writer in terms that can only point to him being the son of God, the savior of the world, God himself. Again, go back to the first paragraph, verse 11. Because John sees heaven open, he sees this white horse. The one sitting on it is called. And now we get the first of four names for Jesus in this passage. Faithful and true. Faithful and true. Basically, these two words stand as synonyms for each other. One reinforces the other to point out with emphasis this truth that Jesus is going to do the thing he said he was going to do that he makes a promise and keeps a promise. And that should give us great confidence just even knowing that he's that kind of a God, faithful and true. In righteousness, in fact, because he's faithful and true, notice, in righteousness, he judges and makes war. He's keeping his word. He said he would vindicate us. He said he would bring justice where there's been injustice. So he's keeping his word. We see, verse 12, that his eyes are like a flame of fire. He has a holy zeal for what he's doing. He's discerning everything in the world, and he's judging it all by his own standard of righteousness. And on his head are many diadems, many crowns, because he's sovereign over all. That's his first name. Notice his second name. His second name is a name written that no one knows but himself. It's a, it's a mystery name. There's certainly a sense in which God is unknowable. It's so far beyond our ability to understand. And yet God also was incarnate that he became flesh like us so that we could know him. And so this is true about God. He's unknowable, but he wants us to know him. And in fact, this unknown name is being revealed to us in the present circumstances of this passage. And we want to hang on to that thought for a few moments because we're going to build towards something here. Verse 13, he's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. This is not his blood. It's not the blood of the lamb. It's not the blood of the martyrs. This is the blood of the ones being judged, the ones who are being slain. Here's the third name. 
He's the Word of God. Weiss Fanning, one of the commentators I'm using in this series, said that this unknown name, or this is an unknown name, but we're grasping it here in a more profound sense than we have ever grasped that previously. Again, just hang on to that thought, this idea of learning more and more about God as that relates to his unknown name. The vision continues in verse 14, the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure. This is the same description we had of the bride of Christ, which is all the redeemed, the believers from all of history, back in verse eight. So this is the redeemed from humanity. This is you, if you believe. Following him, we have our own white horses. Then look at verse 15, from Jesus' mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nation. That's not the first time that we've seen this sharp sword. It's, it's an image we've seen already in Revelation, but also you think about the Apostle Paul. I think Paul told us to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God in Ephesians 6, 17. In Hebrews 4, 12, the preacher, uh, Hebrews is a sermon. The preacher there tells us that the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. This is imagery we understand. The sword is the Word of God. I mean, this is all about Jesus Christ being the Word of God. And according to his word, notice again, he will rule them with a rod of iron. The word rule there is the word shepherd. He will shepherd them with a rod of iron. The shepherd's psalm, Psalm 23, your rod and your staff comfort me. The shepherd carried two a staff that we're more familiar with and the rod that was used to repel uh, predators on the sheep. What became for the ancient kings the scepter that even kings today will hold. It's a symbol of power, a rod of iron here. He will shepherd them with a rod of iron and will tread this image. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. Both of these images pointing to him utterly crushing his enemies. The wine press analogy is that analogy of the grapes and being stomped or being crushed by a mill. The blood pouring out is the blood of those who are being judged. All of which demonstrates his holiness and his justice. And finally, this fourth name is written. Verse 16. On his robe and on his thigh, that is to say, the best way to translate the and there, on his robe, that is to say, on his thigh. No, so think less tattoo and more graphic tea. Okay, like he's, it's imprinted here. And you would say like, why is it imprinted, imprinted there? But he's mounted on the great horse. And the fact that it's on his thigh means that all those around him can see exactly who he is. And who is he? Verse 16, King of kings and Lord of lords. As we saw earlier, many diadems on his head. In fact, all the diadems, every crown is on his head. So we've been given this, this awe-inspiring, incredible image of Jesus. In fact, for some, we stand back in awe reading this, but for some, this is rightfully terrifying. I mean, this is a picture of Jesus that does not necessarily fit everyone's impression of who he is supposed to be. For sure, those outside the church have a very different impression of who Jesus is, but many who would even call themselves believers might have these twisted and distorted images or at least very limited images of who Jesus is in his fullness. I saw a short video this week. I wish I could source it for you, but I don't remember where I saw it. It made the point that, um, that Muslims and Hindus, and I would even add secularists to this, Muslim and Hindus and secularists don't really have any problem with Jesus. They actually, they actually kind of like Jesus. 
They have no particular problem uh, with him as long as he remains in a certain box. They don't, they don't mind. They like him that he's a wise teacher. They like him, in fact, that he's a revolutionary. They, they like the fact that he's an inspiration. They even like the fact that he was a martyr, that he, that he sacrificed himself for his beliefs. They have no particular issue with Jesus as long as he remains all of these things. But the moment that Jesus becomes the Son of God, the moment that his crucifixion is deemed to be the atonement for sin, the moment that there's any discussion of his resurrection from the dead, they're out. And the Muslims and the Hindus and the seculars will reject him. That's where the problem begins for Jesus is at this moment that he's something they didn't expect and don't want. And Revelation 19, Revelation 19 reveals that fault line between the Jesus that people are comfortable with and the Jesus that they are not. And recall again, here's where we're coming to it, all those thoughts that I said, just park that for a minute, we'll come back to it. We, we see right here that, the, that this name that was written back in verse 12, this name that was written that no one knows but himself, we're seeing that name revealed here. It's a thing about Jesus that people are uncomfortable with. It's a greater sense of the real, untethered power of Jesus Christ, the Word of God. That's the part of him that's offensive. Jesus is said to be the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. And the thing that people are tripping over is, is, is the fact that Jesus is the embodiment of the gospel, the embodiment of the redemptive plan. So I want us to think about this. I want to take what time we have left in this message to simply think about Jesus and to challenge our own notions of who, she, who he is. So let's think about this. And don't worry, there's a lot that's gonna come up on the screens. Don't worry about writing it all down. We're gonna pr produce it and provide it in our socials tomorrow. So we'll make that available to you. You can simply listen and think about, first of all, the Jesus that people identify with in love. Let's talk about him because this is part of who he is. The Jesus that people identify with in love. Jesus the infant. People love Jesus the infant. He, he identifies with humanity. That's why so many people who are not believers love to celebrate Christmas. They, they like the little nativity story. It's so sentimental. It's so special. It's so much a part of our traditions. People don't have any trouble with that. They don't have any trouble with Jesus, the rabbi, who taught anyone who would listen. He taught so many good things. Even Gandhi recognized that Jesus taught some amazing things, especially in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, the great physician who healed the sick and the lame. Who could argue with that? Jesus, the compassionate, who touched lepers and cared for the poor. That's, that's, that's very Christian. What a Christian thing for him to do. so comforting. No, Jesus, the mourner who wept for his friend Lazarus, it gives us permission to weep and to grieve for our loved ones. Jesus, the welcomer. Jesus, the welcomer who invited tax collectors and women and Gentiles in. He was so caring. He spent time with those on the margins, the vulnerable. Jesus, the provider, fed the crowds. Jesus, the good citizen, paid his taxes, respected the political order. Jesus, the friend who reached out in love. Jesus, the martyr who willingly gave his life. See, no one has any trouble with any of this list. You go to your unsaved friends and, and, and family members and you pr put this list in front of them and, and they'll all love this Jesus. Jesus lived a good life. Jesus inspired many with his good life. But his first century followers and the crowds that heard him teach and saw him do his ministry should have seen that there were indications 
that he was so much more than this. That there's a whole other side of Jesus, and they were getting these indicators along the way. So we need to look at the hint that he may be more than meets the eye. Again, picture yourself in the first century listening to Jesus teach and watching him as he interacts with people. That's where we want to get to with this. The hint that he may be more than meets the eye. Jesus, the surprising one who walked on water. Yeah, that would be a clue. Nobody else has ever done that before. Jesus, the transfigured one who appeared with Moses and Elijah on the mountain. Jesus, the miracle worker who raised the dead. Or Jesus, the storm ender who stilled the wind and the waves. In fact, at that moment, those in the boat with him did kind of get a clue. And it was a hint to them because they said, who is this? In terror. In terror, they said, who is this? That even the wind and the waves listen to him. Or how about Jesus, the table turner who exposed corruption? Please come to Ottawa. <laughs> so, sorry, was that out loud? I thought that for a minute. Washington, for any of our friends in the United States who happen to be watching. Jesus, the religious rebuker who called out the legalists. No one else dared challenge the religious order of the time, the religious, religious establishment, but Jesus did. This should have been a clue. Jesus, the demon challenger who cast out evil spirits. So terrified were some people with his power over the evil spirits in people that they asked him to leave their region. Would you please just go? Jesus, the enemy lover, forgiving those who crucified him. It's pretty hard to find a Jew in the first century, an Israelite who, who would be happy about the Romans being there and want to forgive the Romans for anything. They were occupiers. They were oppressors. Jesus forgave those who crucified him. Should have been a clue, a hint that he was so much more. Jesus, the tomb escaper, who rose from the dead. Jesus, the heaven ascender, who disappeared into the clouds. They should have known. And some did. But there were also so many for whom this was nothing but trouble. And they rejected him, denied him. Well, then John receives the vision from Jesus himself. And he writes it down. And we all get to see not only the Jesus that people identify with in love, not only the one who gives a hint that he may be so much more than that, but we get to see the proof that he is much more. We get to see Jesus, the white horse rider. That's what we're seeing here. And he brings all of this about simply by his word. This is a revelation of God that maybe we had not thought about or not thought about enough. And so the pressing question is, will you heed his word? Will you follow Jesus? He's the embodiment of the word of God. All of this, everything we're talking about, everything that we've talked about thus far in Revelation, everything yet to come in this grand revelation has been wrought simply by his word. Now, I want, to, I want to just close with this, and I want you, if you have your Bibles open, just go back to chapter one of Revelation, all the way back to where we started. I want you to see this in chapter one again to see how we've gotten to where we are. Because in the opening chapter of Revelation, John is pointing his readers, both his first century readers, those, those members of those seven churches who originally received this revelation, but now to us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we've received this. 
John points us to Jesus. John points us repeatedly in these opening verses to the Word of God and to the hope that we have, the hope that we can have. And he says this in verse 7. We haven't looked at it for a while, but man, we need to be reminded of this. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. You feel the anticipation and the eagerness of this. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, believer and unbeliever. Even those who pierced him and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. There's the judgment. Even so, amen. And what I want, if you're a believer, what I want for you and me is to hear this and be so comforted by these words, by the fact that he is faithful and true, that he's going to do what he said, that he's king of kings and lord of lords, that he is the word of God. And that he's revealing this unknown name to us bit by bit. And I want us to be comforted by that and then motivated to live for him because of that. And to you, unbelievers who are listening to me here and on the video, listen, I want you to join us. I want you to ride with Jesus. I want you to reserve your own white horse to ride with Jesus in Revelation 19. Amen? Let me pray for us. Father, we have, um, through very failing language, sought to exalt Jesus Christ here today, to get a, a more complete picture of who he is. And I pray, Father, as... As I've just said, Father, that as believers, we'd be so encouraged and motivated by that, that we'd be built up in our faith, Father, where there's repentance needed and changes that need to happen, Father, I pray that we would be so willing to have your spirit work in our life in that way. And God, I plead with you right now. I plead with the Holy Spirit to come and convict any who have not yet given their lives to Christ to do so, to reserve their ride with Jesus. You would convict them of their sin. That you would show them that Jesus Christ is the Savior. Father, that you would save them for now and for eternity. Father, this is a work that only your Holy Spirit can do in any of our lives. So I pray that the Spirit would dog us this week and pursue us and convict us and convince us of these things. I pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ.
his way for the risen one is overcome and for every fear there's an empty grave for the risen one is to ask you the same question I asked the other uh, service this morning. Uh, are there some truths that make you feel like dancing? Like you hear something like, oh, that would feel good. If I was a different person, I'd actually be dancing right now. That's the kind of people I think I'm worshiping with this morning. I think that you guys were singing about something that in your heart makes you dance if you're a believer, because we just heard about this victory. We've been hearing about it all along as we've been going through this series about what Jesus is going to do when he comes back. And that's awesome. So we've heard a challenge. If we are believers, we need to respond to this message. As you go into a week, if you believe, how is that, re that belief going to change what you do this afternoon, what you do on Monday through Friday? I hope it will encourage you to be comforted, but also to be on mission. And then for people in this room who maybe today you didn't come in believing in Jesus Christ. Perhaps you came in and thought, nah, I'm still not going to believe. Well, you've heard again that Jesus is the victor. He's going to win. And you might be gambling saying, I don't believe it. We want to encourage you to consider, reconsider what future you want. We'd encourage you to reserve your white horse and to make a plan to ride with Jesus. If you need to pray today about anything, particularly maybe coming to the Lord or some burden that might be on your heart, we invite you to stay in this room. Come to the front. We'll have some of our people here to pray with you and just help you bring your words before Christ. If you're new with us, you haven't introduced yourself to any of our staff or our pastors, we'd love to have you join us in Guest Central, where we can give you a little coffee card and say thanks for coming. And the rest of you guys, we're going to leave you with the same challenge we keep doing every week, uh, to begin that sense of the kingdom now and just get to know each other. If you see someone in the room that you haven't met before, make a beeline, be that strange person, go right to them like, I haven't met you yet. Tell them your name, find out their story, have a coffee together, make our church a little smaller place. You're going into the week knowing you have a pretty cool savior and as you go we want you to remember that you are loved thanks again for joining us today it's always good to spend time together being encouraged by worship blessed by prayer and challenged by the word a reminder that harvest kids lessons and information on what's happening can be found at hbc.info to connect with someone on our pastoral team, please contact us at info at harvestberry.ca or call the office at the number on our website. I'd also like to invite you, if you're able, to join us in person at 7 George Street in Barrie at 9 or 11 a.m. next Sunday. God bless you. See you next week.